With regard to international political lobbying on human rights, both um, Jane and I were in Warsaw for the OSCE annual human rights conference last year, which came just at the end, just after our, our last AGM. And Kevin Sheehan and I were at the same meeting this year in, in Warsaw. That's an annual meeting that the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe hold to discuss the human rights aspects of their work. And what we were highlighting at those meetings is the ongoing breaches of human rights of atheists, both in Ireland and internationally, in, in, in terms of the, the fundamental human rights of freedom of conscience, religion and belief, freedom of expression, equality for the law, freedom from discrimination. Also, we were focusing on the rights of pregnant women to health, particularly with regard to abortion laws, and the rights of the child and the right to secular education. And one of the things that we asked the OSCE to do on an international basis is they have, over the past few years, had uh, meetings specifically to, to evaluate and quantify and, and combat discrimination against Muslims and against Jews and against Christians and members of other religions. And we have asked them to hold a similar event to quantify and combat discrimination against atheists and non-religious people generally around the OSCE countries. Now, one of our other major things this year was we published advice for parents and uh, who, were, who were making a submission to the Department of Education's consultation on promoting greater inclusiveness in primary schools. We went through all the list of the issues. Sometimes I feel with the education that is a language, that you have to have the right kind of language for people to use. So that was very useful for parents to be able to categorise where their complaints came under and what they wanted. So that was very important for us as well. We've made submissions to the Equality the authority on section 37 to amend that and we also appeared before an Eructus committee on education and we made um, issue, a huge issue over education, access to education and um, we have that up on our website as well. Another area where we get involved in is that we engage with the Irish Human Rights Commission and the Equality Authority. They're one now at the moment and we, any new case that comes up at the European Court or anything like that, we uh, email them, keep in contact with them and keep them up to date with what we're doing on the ground. Because that's very important. Because everything, they have had a huge report out a few years ago and we can support every one of their recommendations. Not, no other patron body is saying that they support all their recommendations. There's no other patron body or group uh, and saying clearly that they should remove Rule 68, remove discrimination against teachers, and amend the primary school curriculum. We are the only groups that are doing that on the ground, so we engage with that. Regionally, uh, we decided that we would use a system called Meetup, which is essentially a social networking outfit. So, uh, that, uh, uh, and we seem to be attracting people, if you like, who are from outside. So generally people who are in towns and in uh, various parts of Ireland uh, are looking for social activities, things for them to do, and we seem to be getting it. And uh, I think that has real possibilities. We could actually get a lot more activities in the branches, leading to more members based on our branch activity. So I can tell you that we have branches in Dublin, some of them we uh, haven't gone on, but let's go through the list that we've had. Dublin, Kevin Monaghan, Newbridge, Navan, Letterkenny, Sligo, Roscommon, Galway, Cork, Waterford, Kilkenny, and Trim. We did one with Peter's group in Limerick. We'd like to do some more. And I can announce today that we have our first um, brunch in Belfast. So we've gone international, if you like. <laughs> That. Um, another thing that grew from branches is the notion of a regional committee. So you're talking to the national committee here, but there are now three regional committees. One is based in Dublin, that's run by Ashley. Another one is in Cavan Monaghan, which is run by John Hamill. And there's another one, Northwest, and we have some of the members here, but we don't have the chair here at the moment. Health sick. Health sick. Health sick, okay. Um, the idea of those regional committees is to act as the third level of our political lobbying and 
advocacy. Atheists in the pub started back up this year in January. Um, and so this, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the speakers that I've had. Um, so I'd have uh, Tony Philpott, who is the author of Faithless. I've had um, a gentleman who's a member of Baby Star and who is from Pakistan, who we couldn't name on the night we recorded, uh, we didn't record it, we normally record it, just to protect his identity because he, he would like to go home at some stage. And um, we had Gary Kyo, who's a theologian. We've had our own Brendan Marr, who spoke about the information table that he sets up um, outside the GPO there, the second Saturday of each month. We had Tara Flynn, the actress and comedian. We had Max, Max Krasinowski from LGBT Noise. Um, then Michael and Jane spoke about their um, going to the UN Human Rights Committee. Um, we had Paul Redmond, the chairperson of Adoption Rights Now. And we had Daniel Agra Ander, and so I can say all these names now. Yeah. <laughs> um, who spoke, he's a Swedish atheist um, and was a member of an ex Mormon, so he spoke on that. The other big human rights international aspect of our work over the last year was the culmination of a number of years' work in the United Nations Human Rights Committee questioning Ireland uh, in, in Geneva on Ireland's obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now there are a, a range of areas where the rights of atheists have been uh, breached and indeed minority faith members have been breached in Ireland that, uh, that we asked the United Nations Human Rights Committee to put on their agenda, a number of which were put on the agenda, and then we were over at Geneva both, both briefing the United Nations Human Rights Committee before the meeting and uh, communicating with them during the meeting to, to uh, on a sort of a real-time basis to let them know where things that the Irish state were saying were inaccurate and to enable follow-up questions. And uh, it was absolutely a wonderful experience. I was so proud to be there to represent. We were representing the first atheist just atheist organisation that ever went to one of these consultations at the UN and it was really, really interesting. Now it was very hard work and, and Alison Mahinney went as well, Dr Alison Mahinney, so there was the three of us there. She was a neutral ac academic and uh, myself and Michael and on the day and the, those two days we worked really hard and there was an awful lot of other Irish NGOs there on various issues. Uh, from um, the Travellers' Rights, the ICC, L were there, um, abortion rights campaign, all different organisations, and we all worked um, together through the session. We found ourselves in a strange position, to be quite honest, because there was no other organisation there fighting. We were fighting, of course, we were there for uh, secularists and atheists, but we found ourselves in the position that we were defending the rights of religious minorities as well. Because religious minorities, suffer discrimination in access to education. They get refused because they have, can produce a Catholic baptismal certificate. So we were uh, facing some members of the UN Human Rights Committee arguing, uh, not arguing with them, pointing out that it's not only atheists and secularists that Ireland discriminates. It discriminates against religious minorities because they can't produce a Catholic baptismal certificate to get into their local school they have to try and knock their children out of uh, religion and school as well. And they suffer the same discrimination that we do. In, in the area of discrimination against t teachers in, uh, in schools <coughs> under the, the exemption that religious schools have uh, from our Equality Acts that allows them to discriminate against, t against teachers to protect the religious ethos of the, uh, the school, the Irish government put forward at the UN Human Rights Committee that they were improving that. They said that, that, that they were passing a new law that was going to uh, remove discrimination against gay teachers by preventing the uh, schools from using that clause to discriminate against gay teachers. And they put forward that as a positive step to the United Nations Human Rights Committee. Now, had we not been there, that would have gone through as a positive step and would have been seen by as, as, as Ireland... Um, tackling this discrimination. But because we were there, we were able to point out to the Human Rights Committee that this bill does not protect atheist teachers from discrimination. What it does is it, it prevents the schools from using the exemption that allows them to discriminate on the grounds of religion to also discriminate on the grounds of gender um, or sexuality. And so 
So we, we on, on foot of that, the, the committee asked Ireland about that and asked specifically does this bill uh, protect atheist teachers from discrimination and that is now in their final concluding observations that they want those, those laws to be amended to end all forms of discrimination as opposed to just the discrimination that, that the government is trying to, to get away with repealing. And we don't kind of talk about this very much on our website, but we also give, have a service for parents in schools who complain about, um, have complaints about religious education and trying to opt out. And we get an awful lot of complaints. And because of the nature of that, we have to deal on a one-to-one -one basis. And I deal with them all the time. I personally reply to every single one of those complaints. And they usually drop everything else and deal with that complaint. Now, when it comes down to it, I actually do um, a letter for them for the school and it'll be their particular case and what the problem is um, and I send that back to them. Now this year for the first time I've noticed it, noticed there, there's I'm getting complaints from parents that would call themselves religious but they're trying to opt, they don't want to force their child to um, take religious education in school because the child doesn't want to do it. So. They've tried to opt their child out of religion, even though they would call themselves Catholic. So I, I, we've had to amend our, um, our, we have on Teach Don't Preach, we want a website called Teach Don't Preach, where all our information and research on education goes into that. So we have um, a letter, sample letters on that, and we have information about opting out of school. So I've had to amend that to, um, for religious parents that want to opt their um, child out. With regards to national political lobbying, the, um, the main issues during the year have been the Constitutional Convention, um, which uh, made several recommendations that, uh, that sort of touch in, in some way on secular issues, uh, and, and one that very specifically uh, relates to secular issues, which is their recommendation that the blasphemy clause be removed from the Constitution. Now, on foot of that, and again as a culmination of a process where we've been lobbying for the past five years since that law was first introduced, uh, in, both nationally and internationally, and, and pointing out the international impact of that in terms of the, the uh, Islamic states of the United Nations, using the fact that a Western democracy has passed a new blasphemy law in the 21st century to bolster their case for defending their own blasphemy laws and for indeed trying to spread blasphemy laws, or as they now describe it, defamation of Islam around the world, we finally, next year, will have an opportunity to campaign to remove the blasphemy clause from our constitution. Now that might be complicated by the wording that the government uses if the government chooses to insert a new clause that, that relates to a prohibition of incitement to religious hatred. Depending on the wording of that, that could cause problems for us. We're going to have to wait and see what the wording is to see uh, what impact that would have on our campaign. But one way or another, we should have an opportunity in the next year to, to finally get rid of one of the, the most overt sort of medieval theological crimes that, that, that is still in the constitution of, of a 21st century pluralist republic. Look, because we're in Dublin, there's a lot of protests, and we love a good protest. So we've taken part in, um, and you see some of the really good photos here, uh, the Pride Parade this year was the first time we take part in that, and we marched with our banner. We took part in the March for Marriage Equality, and we took part in the March for Choice. We also held, um, a, with Michael and Jane, a, a training day for people who had signed up for the regional group and around media, de uh, interacting and dealing with media and around um, lobbying politicians. Um, and we've started a second information table on the third Saturday of each month. We've put outside the central bank as a venue. It's hidden as we're going to shop around and see if we can find a slightly better venue. We have a big project in the pipeline that we're just starting to talk about. Um, I don't want to say too much. We're, will, I, will I say? Yeah, okay. Um, we're, we're going to look next year at running a film festival, an atheist film festival. Um, so myself and Mike have started work on that. So if anyone is interested and in, in, has any experience in doing, doing anything like that, please let me know and, and we'd love you to come on board. And we're really looking forward to getting involved with the blasphemy campaign next year as well. So anyone who's interested in 
and uh, locally getting involved in that, let me know. And there's really three sides to what we do, uh, so very quickly, uh, the first side is what Kevin describes as um, the social or outreach uh, type work, essentially trying to recruit new members. Uh, so we run some brunches. Um, we also tried to uh, set up the stand at the Monaghan Market Day, which would be the largest uh, gathering of people, really. Uh, we were told we wouldn't get permission from that as there were two Christian preachers uh, running stands at the market, and they wouldn't like to have an atheist around the place. <laughs> so uh, we have a case running in the Equality Tribunal on that. Um, the second side of it is uh, media, which is essentially, uh, as Kevin described, uh, radio interviews or articles in the press. So generally, if um, uh, Michael and Jane bring back achievements from the UN or whatever it happens to be, uh, we try and get some uh, media coverage uh, around that in the local press uh, and local radio stations. Um, and the third side of it then is political lobby, which is really uh, meetings with all the local uh, elected representatives. Um, so that's been a bit of a, a mixed bag. Uh, we've got round, I think, uh, all of our TDs and senators um, and a couple of uh, MEPs so far. Um, some of them were uh, quite positive, and some of them were quite hostile, and several of them were largely apathetic. Another um, issue has come up that we do a lot of research on is um, teacher uh, training and teacher colleges at second level and at primary level. Now at this stage, uh, from the research we've done, it looks like um, the Catholic Church has literally control over teacher training at second level and they can veto um, a, a religion teacher at second level. As, uh, all second level schools are obliged to have religious instruction and worship in them. That is, uh, Catholic schools themselves, uh, community schools, which are supposed to be state schools, community colleges and designated community colleges. Now we've just we've all the documentation uh, to show that you have to um, get uh, approval from the Catholic Church to get a job as a religious education teacher in any of those schools. Now that religion course, that's part of, is supposed to be a state course, it's an exam course, but you still need approval from the Catholic Church to get a job as a teacher. So um, we're working away on that as well. And we're the only, seem to be the only ones that are doing that. So we've been having brunches since, um, since January every month. Um, we've run two information tables on Shop Street. Um, both were pretty successful. Shop Street in which town? In Galway. In Galway. The capital of the place. And uh, we've, we've met a few politicians. There's one thing generally about the, about the politicians is, um, unfortunately, that they, they, even those that are overtly atheist, uh, the closer they get to power, the, the uh, less interest they are in, in, in you know, actively truly vindicating the rights of, of atheists and secularists. Um, so so we, we, you know, we have a long way to, to go, but what we're trying to do with, with, with regards to politicians is to build up a database of information about the positions that they've taken on, on, on issues so that we can divide them up into you know, those, po those politicians who, who are generally aware and supportive, who we have to keep informed of things, those politicians who are never going to come onto our side, which we won't waste time on, and then the sort of middle ground ones that, that we can spend most of our time on in terms of trying to, to, to convince them. Oh, Civil Registration Act. Well, anybody that was at the AGM last year knows the work we've been trying to do on the Civil Registration Act. Now, when you stand back from the Civil Registration Act and just look at it from a distance, it is just basically <coughs> discrimination. It's the discrimination that's in the education system. It's discrimination in the Civil Registration Act. There's nobody denying that it's discrimination. But they're saying the discrimination is proportionate and legitimate. That's the main thing. That's what they're saying. Now, under the Freedom of Information Act, um, um, bodies like the Civil Registration uh, Service are, are obliged to have a manual telling you why they take decisions and how they take decisions and the criteria for making decisions. The Information Commissioner told us they haven't got the statutory power to compel the Civil Registration Service or, uh, to give us one of those um, manuals. So we're back at the Ombudsman again. We're back to the Ombudsman. 
and there it lays at the moment. A caseworker is going to be assigned to us. So we're, we have to see how well that goes. But we're there. We had ongoing issues with the website um, for a couple of years. Um, so this year now, we looked at getting that sorted. And so we um, hired a, a web development team and they uh, revamped the front page and also a lot of stuff that is not very visible, what goes on in the background with the membership. Um, so it's easier for us to manage the membership on that. So um, uh, we're still open to anybody finds any broken links or anything that, that needs improving, just drop um, myself and Kevin a line and we get working on that. Um, the main thing will be that um, because we've changed systems from the old database onto the new database that everybody will be um, we're going to cancel all uh, renewed, or we have cancelled all um, uh, renewed PayPal. So anybody who, whose membership comes up, they will have to go back onto the, the join page and log on um, onto the new system. And then from there, they can select if they want to have recurring payments or not recurring payments. We basically get the majority of our money in through membership and donations, and then we prioritise activities during the year, and we, we spend our money to achieve the best outcome uh, that, that was the, that we set ourselves. Um, roughly, we um, we try and keep over ten thousand at the bank, and then whatever money we get during the, during the year for membership and subscriptions, that's prioritised for spending. The balances at the end of two thousand and thirteen are roughly we roughly fourteen and a half thousand in the bank. And to give an update, uh, we currently have about sixteen thousand six hundred in the bank roughly. So overall, we have uh, cash in the bank that's in a very healthy situation. Uh, one, one, one issue that we are fundraising on now is an education-based fund to fund an ATA, uh, a curriculum that teaches about atheistic in a, in, in a, in a pluralistic fashion. Um, it currently has around 7,000 euro in it, and uh, people have been very generous with that, so thank you very much. Um, but as, um, everyone's euro that is, that is donated is very welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank three individuals who have donated um, substantial amounts, uh, Joe Davis, Dave Kiernan, and uh, Michael Davis, so thank you very much for that. And uh, thanks to everyone who has donated their respect for us. Thank you very much. There were a range of other issues at the United Nations Human Rights Committee. Most significantly, uh, the Irish government was being questioned about abortion law, and they were being asked why pregnant women were not given their right to abortion under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in wider circumstances than abortion is allowed in, the, in Irish law. And the Irish state's response to that was to say that under another article of the Covenant, the people are allowed to freely express their will, and they said that the Irish government was, was reflecting the freely expressed will of the Irish people with regards to the uh, 1983 referendum and with regards to the laws that have been passed <coughs> since then. And the United Nations Human Rights Committee told Ireland that that was a completely unacceptable reason to deny women their rights to an abortion. They said that the whole point of human rights law is to protect people from the tyranny of the majority, and that you cannot use majority votes either in Parliament or in referendums to deny people their human rights, that it undermines the entire fabric of international human rights law. And they, they then, in, in very diplomatic terms, invited Ireland to... Uh, to withdraw that reason and come up with another reason. And after a break in the session, the Irish government, through the Minister for Justice who was leading the delegation, the Irish government accepted the point that the UN Human Rights Committee had made and accepted that majority votes cannot be used to derogate from human rights obligations. Now, they haven't reflected that here. They're still in Ireland saying that they're reflecting the, the, uh, the 1983 referendum. Um, but, but they have accepted, this is a very significant point, they have accepted that principle. And that principle extends, we would argue, to any human rights that are being violated on the basis of majority votes. So it would extend to the freedom of expression, it would extend to, to uh, freedom from discrimination generally, equality before the law. It would extend in particular to another area where, where Ireland is, uh, in our view, misled the International Human Rights Committee, which was with regard to, um, to, to secular education and why there are no non-denominational schools as opposed to multi-denominational schools. And the reason that Ireland gave was that the usual thing of, 
well, you, you can set one up if there's, a, if, if there's a sufficient number of, of parents who want it in an area. The idea of saying that parental demand in an area is a requirement for you to vindicate your right to secular education is just a localised version of the argument that they call abortion. It's saying that if a majority of people in your locality want you to have your right to secular education, then you can have it, and if they don't, then you, you, you don't. And as, so essentially what that is saying is that your human rights and your vindication of your human right to a secular education is dependent on the views of your neighbours, which is an outrageous approach to, to, uh, to vindicating human rights. So, so those are the, the sort of main issues with regard to the international lobbying that we've done. It, it's been a significant year for us, and particularly the UN Human Rights Committee issue, what was the, the culmination of just a lot of work where, where we, we have been putting together uh, inputs into this process over the past few years and, and we now have what will effectively be the, the core of our human rights policy campaigning for the foreseeable future uh, where, where we will be able to say on, on certain issues it's not just that we think these are a good idea but we're, we're saying that these are the minimum human rights standards that Ireland has already agreed to grant to us by signing up to these human rights treaties.